Hey everyone, this is Brendan Ryder, producer of The Cube Podcast. We have a special episode for you this week as The Cube was busy covering three events, Boomi World in Denver, Colorado, RSA Conference in San Francisco, and Red Hat Summit also in Denver, Colorado. We took our favorite interviews from each of these shows and compiled them into this feed here. We'll start with John Furrier's conversation with Boomi CEO Steve Lucas, then jump over to RSA and listen to Dave Vellante's talk with Zscaler CEO Jay Chaudhry, then head back to Denver for Rebecca Knight and Rob Stretch's interview with Red Hat CEO Matt Hicks. You can check out all of the interviews from each of these events on thecube.net and read all of our written coverage on siliconangle.com. Without further delay, let's jump into John's interview with Steve Lucas. Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's live coverage here at Boomi World in Denver. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, day three of our coverage. We're here with Steve Lucas, the CEO of Boomi. Welcome back on theCUBE. You're solo, we're going to dig into your awesome keynote, but also a lot of questions. Welcome back. Thank you, John, it's great to see you. So, talking a big game up there on the keynote yesterday, bold vision, it's not iPass, it's bigger. Your vision connects an integration market with Boomi's success and bringing in the dots to connect with Gen AI. Um, a lot of people are talking about it. Uh, well, look, it's, I mean, you, you and I, we talk about this all the time. We, we live in a fractured software world, right? There's, you pick a category and, and there are many, many things out there. The, the issue that we're trying to solve, it's, it's really quite simple. It's customers have tons of applications, databases, yeah. APIs. That's an integration challenge, right? Why would you solve that integration challenge with a dozen integration products? It doesn't make any sense, right? It, 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 so for us, it's a single solution for integration and automation. And I know that makes sense. It's kind of on paper, right? And proof's going to be in the pudding. But we, we made some, some big moves yesterday, yeah. announced some acquisitions. We've also expanded our strategy into data management as well as AI and the like. But to your point, it's more than I pass. Yeah, and I think the API move really ups the game, personally, because it's the cloud and on-prem. I mean, Boomi's leverage, your CFO had a great chat with me on here, uh, President and CFO, it's a good business model, Boomi. It is. It's not a lot of professional services, it's all SaaS, it's in the cloud, you got great agility, your customers love the product, uh, it solves real hard problems, on integrating, and then complex systems, by the way, too. Right. And then also, you got the platform opportunity. So, so you got a disruptive enablement opportunity. And I want to ask you about that. You got the enterprise platform that you announced with all the elements in there. I love the agent card, and we're going to come back to that. Yeah. But what I saw up there wasn't an iPass company. It was a enterprise platform company. So the question is, and you've been around many cycles of innovation, this one we're in is a disruptive enabler, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Which means some things will go away in light of the new inflection that we're going through. It yeah. happened in every single cycle. It will. Some stuff doesn't make it because it's not, it's antiquated and old and it deserves to be retired. Yeah. What gets disrupted? If well, you go down this path, what's going to get disrupted? Well, for, so there's two layers, there are layers, John, there's <laughs> layers. The first layer, so first of all, what gets disrupted, irrespective of Boomi, whatever it may be, is everything. The argument yesterday was, find me an application that doesn't get disrupted or really reimagined due to large language models and, and, and pre-trained transformers. This new world of AI that we're in, it, it's not the same. This is not a Apple giraffe image recognition thing. This is the ability to reason. It, it really is powerful. I agree with Eric Schmidt. I think that this round of AI is underhyped, not overhyped. So there's that. Okay. Yeah. Layer two. What gets disrupted with Boomi going this path? First of all, why would any application vendor rebuild how I connect to applications and databases? How do I wrangle these APIs? Yet that's like a common starting point. It makes no sense, especially given Boomi just does that. But for me it was, how do we apply to our application database and API management solutions that we have this, this open API or, or infrastructure yeah. where you, you can write anything on top of it? That's what we're doing. That opens up a lot, number one. But number two, now coming back to the AI, piece, what really changes is we can open up the world of anyone that wants to take a small language model, large language model, and create something yeah. overnight, be disruptive in a category that can go through Boomi to do that, 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 that lowers the barrier to entry to near zero. Yeah, and I think, and, and it, also, it also highlights, um, it's a very nuanced point, but I want to get your reaction to this, it also highlights next generation cloud scale. So, iPaaS, well, I'm oversimplifying it, my, my words, not data categorical. iPaaS was a category for old stuff. You put it together, you, yeah. you, you integrate 
a platform, That's two right. things together. It, the, the internet is one big connective thing, set of things. So now you're always connecting. You're always integrating, and, and the Stripe relationship's interesting because they do something really, really well. Global payments that gets integrated with a click of some, some code. They do do that well. Okay, so why? <laughs> they, so, they're and, good. And you do your thing. So your partnering with Stripe highlights to me where, where the internet needed to go for cloud next gen, so scale and connecting. 100%. I mean, call that integration. I mean, we can call whatever you want, but when you connect two systems together in, yeah. a, in a global system, is that a category or is it just reality? I mean, that's well, enterprise reality, not, I, I not think necessarily it, a category. Well, we all, I, th I think the thing is like, we as humans, we want to label it all, right? And it's a little difficult yeah. because it's like, well, what does Boomi do, right? Well, it integrates things, yeah. it automates things. The way I, I characterize it, like, it, it's, we interconnect and build processes. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. Do we have the perfect label? Well, you know, yesterday yeah. I heard the term hyper-automation. Ah. Not bad. Yeah, just hyper is a good one. Throw in front of anything. Hyperscale. Uh, hyper automation. Hyper, hyper convergence. You know, but here's the thing: <laughs> like organizations like Stripe, what they need is yeah. the ability to go that last mile, right? Yeah. And if, if Boomi, with 20,000 customers, we already do that, then integrating Stripe and Boomi is kind of the no-brainer, right? Now yeah. we need to times that by the many strategic players out there. But I think the Stripe Boomi one is natural. Well, I, it's also illustrative on another point. I want to get your reaction on. I think, and this is what, what's uh, clear to me, at least coming out of Boomi World 24 is that you guys are at scale, and so is Stripe. So I could actually create an alternative to Stripe. Integrate something easy, put it on my site, but then I can't replicate the back end. They're globally scalable. You guys are uniquely positioned as kind of an independent third party in um, Switzerland. It's, I, it, mean, I mean, the landscape's uh, crazy. It, do you guys consider yourself Switzerland when you look at yeah. this, this layer, I mean, Switzerland meaning independent? Yeah, I, I think mean, independent. Because your API play is saying that, but use whatever you want, customer. That's the thing, I mean, so, you know, the, the, first of all, you know, if you look at Salesforce acquiring MuleSoft, right, that was a catalyst for a lot of change in the market, right? And Salesforce, you know, the, the, the reality is like, if Salesforce isn't buying something right now, wait five minutes, right? They, and they're, they're brilliant over there, but they bought MuleSoft, and that was a large independent integration automation player that was taken out of the market as an independent, and that left Boomi as the modern architecture, and. Uh, just, we're taking advantage of that, obviously, yeah. right? But we want to expand, so we announced the acquisition of two API management companies yesterday. Why? Well, there's a vacuum in the market, right? Yeah. Why would we not do that? So Boomi's gone from integration automation to plus API management soon, and, and we're building out plus data management as well. We think we can be that one platform for the enterprise. Do you see platform sprawl coming, and tool sprawl, and API sprawl as a feature or a bug? Of the of the of the future yeah. world we're in, yeah. because if you think about the abstraction, you talk about complexity on stage. I thought what I appreciated your your comment there. You're solving with simplicity, not more complexity, right? Well, so it, that's the old way. <laughs> it's, well, it is right, but it's I mean, it, so for all of the and you said this, and I think you say it better that you 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 have this unique perspective in the world, which is look all of these things that have been invented over the past three, four decades, right? They've converged. They've given rise to things like this new kind of intelligence that we have with AI, and that's great. They all converge, blah, blah, blah. You'd think things would get simpler, yet they're getting more complicated. There's more apps, there's more yeah. databases. The average enterprise today has over 360 cloud apps alone, over a thousand databases. Yeah. That's not simpler. Yeah. So our job is to kind of help wrangle that, simplify it, that makes sense, right? But I think things are going to get more complicated before yeah. they get simpler because we have the, the, the agents are coming, right? Yeah. Now it's, we have these large language models, small language models, let's build these semi-autonomous yeah. agents on top of them. Every software company's doing it. So when we introduce yeah. those into the API application database now agent mix, it gets complex. Well, that's, I think you're onto something there. We just put out some, a new survey research from the Cube Research for RSA, uh, when in fact, it's counterintuitive if you think about it. Everybody's talking about platform consolidation and tool consolidation. Actually, the tools are increasing, and they're yeah. not sunsetting the old tools, mainly because new use cases are emerging, new threats are emerging, and the older platforms solve that threat, but not, so there are more tools coming out in security. Right. And that's, that's because there's 
new things to solve. Well, and even from an integration, like if, again, my issue, like if you have an integration, let's say challenge or problem or opportunity, I have hundreds, thousands of applications. The, the solution is not, oh, let me go get a dozen integration products and solve my integration problem with an integration problem. It doesn't work that way. That's not what you should be doing. But you walk into the average enterprise today, they've got a dozen integration tools, a dozen automation tools. How is that helping? It's not. But again, coming back to okay. the AI piece, this will exist exacerbate the issue, it's time for organizations to consolidate yeah. onto that singular platform, and again, that's why, yeah. if you look at what we're building out, integration, automation, API management, data management, one platform yeah. that we're, we're calling it the, the Boomi Enterprise Platform, we haven't named it Bob or Susie, but <laughs> cleverly the, the Boomi yeah. Enterprise Platform. Well, I think the API plays a good example because there are players out there that are taking a bottoms up approach with open source, um, but if you look at what you guys have is you've got the crown jewels of the company, you're working mission critical workloads, and I don't think it's hard to get switching costs to have some random point solution sway a platform that's managing critical systems, critical data, and orchestrating the APIs. Yeah. I mean, so I think that's a good bet. So um, I think that might play well. So, and 85% of all the internet traffic is, goes through APIs. Yeah. So, I mean, just think just about a that. little bit. It's like the plumbing. <laughs> yeah, well it is, we live, we live in an API driven world, right? I mean like this yeah. cup yeah. probably has an API, I don't know, but it, it, you know, everything seems to have yeah. an API on it. And, and look, it's a different view. You, yeah. you, you know, Boomi traditionally has been the, hey, we'll connect to all these things, we have yeah. connectors and make it easy to drag, drop, connect. And we've introduced AI versions yeah. of that and that's lovely. But applying APIs to darn near everything in the world, it lets developers interconnect yeah. systems and that's cool. But the average company today is you know, looking at 30 30 to 50,000 APIs that they have to think yeah. about across their applications and systems, and that's the least complex of these scenarios, right? So, yeah. getting your arms around this, it's not going to get easier. Yeah, and I think the APIs, although connecting things at scale becomes more problematic. I think that's what you guys are doing. Yeah. So I want to get to your keynote. You made a couple comments, I want to get into it. So, the, the integration and automation, check, Boomi. Yep. Gold star, that. blue ribbon. Yeah, we're done. doing our thing. Doing great. <laughs> Now you're starting to see the management team come in. A lot of SAP background, a lot of kind of web services, tech people, so you got the, the tech. So are you guys looking at it from an IT modernization platform or more of a line of business um, opportunity? Because you kind of got toes in both waters there, or does that converge too? and the ecosystem picks up the line of business market. Well, I think, how, would I mean, you, how would you see that? It, it has to converge, it, but here's why. Look at, look at, I mean, IT, especially the past decade, right? They've ceded some power, capability, authority to the line of business, yeah. right? Line yeah. of business, yeah. they're more empowered to pick an application, come in, and then the CIO has to figure out, okay, how do I graph that into our standards, our governance, yeah. and the like? Line of business empowered, that's not going away. It's not. Yeah. So for us, it's how do we, first of all, empower and supercharge IT, do more with less, right? Again, everything we talked about. But at the same time, in line of business, look at our partnership with Vi and I, which is a conversational yeah. finance solution. Yeah. That technology, their product called FinTalk, plugs right into Boomi. You can literally turn on conversational finance with your SAP system. That's not existed before. <laughs> I'm not building yeah. warehouses and lakes and charts and graphs. I'm just talking to it and getting answers, and that's through Boomi. That's what we're seeing. So I think to your point, it's both. Well, this is why I found it interesting because there's two issues there to, to unpack. One, Boomi's go to market in the line of business and technology. So now the next question is, okay, the agent garden and ecosystem that you guys have. Do you guys fulfill that line of business creativity, the democratization, does that come from the ecosystem or both? How do you see that? Because FinTalk's a great example. Well, I, I mean, I, that's an OEM deal with Michelle Sicca, who's, who, by the way, has great street cred to get him to put a check mark on yeah. you guys. So, does, it, does that come from the ecosystym or is Boomi going to be doing more LO line of business applications? So I think it's an ecosystem play first. Now Boomi, we've built our own set of agents, but those agents are things like click a button, automatically synchronize all your information. Uh, our AI agents yeah. that watch where PII goes, data governance, and, and, and uh, design agents, that's great. Things like uh, what, what uh, Vishal Sika's organization fin, and what they produce with FinTalk, what that will do, it's the first of many line of business applications integrated by these third parties into Boomi. So I can't help but my sales, let my Salesforce heartstrings tug on me a little bit back to the App <laughs> yeah. Exchange and Force.com yeah, yeah. days. Look, th there are going to be these 
agent marketplaces. We're introducing what I believe to be the first one. Yeah. Now this is, you know, we're, we're, we're not looking to corner the market on, but I'll tell you one more thing about agent marketplaces. Look, you should be able to go into an agent marketplace and say, I need an agent to talk to my finance system, like what we have with yeah. Vianna. The same for sales, yeah. the same for marketing, the same for HR, that's going to be part of it, and we're opening the doors, and just here at this conference this yeah, week, yeah. hundreds of those opportunities, so we're going to see that but there's more to it than that. Yeah. When these agents, and you know this like better, again, better than anybody, when these agents are running around yeah. your organization, whether they go through Boomi yeah. or not is irrelevant. Who's minding the shop? Where are these agents registering? How do I know what decisions they're making? No self-respecting CIO or COO will let hundreds of semi-autonomous or autonomous yeah. agents just go, you know what, do I have a discount for you? And they're hallucinating, yeah, yeah. right? You need to know these things, so beyond the garden, yeah. We're building, and I didn't actually announce this on stage yesterday, but we're building an agent registry. And this is where any agent, so every CIO will want an agent. Yeah. It doesn't matter from where to register. Yeah. That's great, we got a scoop here on theCUBE. That's a great point. So, if we, so a couple of things that are coming out of the CUBE interviews, which I want to share with you and get your reaction. We're going to come back to this uh, agent registry. One of your, your CTO mentioned economics. He's writing a book called Unbundled, soon to be on Amazon. Plug for your book, Matt. Ah, um, uh, yes. So, Economics of data is going to be a discussion. Registry, reg, a registry implies some sort of verification. Yep. We're kind of in this data supply chain opportunity. So we've talked about software supply chain. You look at Docker, they have a little registry for containers and, and, and uh, serverless, that market's growing. But you look at data. Lineage has always been talked about in data, but yep. you're getting into a world where it's a kind of horizontal scalable data model with the ability to have that built into the app as well. So you have two dimensions of, of I guess this is the chess game on, on data, which is yeah. what do you make horizontally scalable Yeah. and well, how do you manage the supply chain? I don't want the agents, rogue agents going out, you know, taking over infrastructure. Well, it's data and it's decisions, right? And it doesn't matter. Pick an area of your company, right? I served up expense reports. I have this, I have this war against expense reports. And it, I, I, am, <laughs> I am not a fan of expense reports. <laughs> I'm not a fan. <laughs> Yet here we are in 2024 and you, you, you know, you'll get up tomorrow, I'll get up tomorrow, and there will be an expense report to approve. Why in 2024, with large language models that can be trained perfectly on human judgment and corporate policy, why are we approving expense reports? Two years from now, no one will do that. Yeah. Two years from now. Thank God. Thank you, right? So, <laughs> but that's a decision that, that we held as human beings that we will gladly cede to AI. Yeah. Now multiply that times a thousand or 10,000 because of all these decisions that we hold as humans. Yeah. So it's not just the data, it's the decisions. Yeah. I believe this registry needs to be about these, the data, the agents, and the decisions that they make yeah. independent of human beings. Yeah. I still want to know what they're deciding. I mean, they're, they're basically verified. It's, it's business logic, it's coming back full circle. Yep. I mean, the world's yeah, changed. Okay, so the, the big strategic question is, is that what's next on the M&A front? Um, what's the next um, organic growth you're going to do? So inorganic growth, organic growth, you're making the big moves, great, great props there. You got a great CFO you've worked with, he's done M&A at SAP. Yeah. You've seen the movie many times. Yeah. What's, the, what's the inorganic and organic uh, to-do items for you? Well, yeah, as you know, so organic, or inorganically, we announced the acquisition of Mashery as well as a PETA, so that's part of our API management yep. strategy. On the M&A front, then I'll come back, well, so on the organic front, actually, it's all about data management. So we are building out our ETL. We're building out uh, master data management capabilities, more so than we have today. We are in and expanding in the data management market. Yeah. We will win there and M&A will happen there as well. So data management is a big yeah. win area for us because our customers want us to expand there. We're going to do that. In API, or, or sorry, in the AI world, look, you know, Boomi's ability to take Something that's really complicated today. I go get a model like mm -hmm. Llama yeah. 3, for example, built by Meta. Yeah. I have some data. I want to fine tune or ground that model. Th that's a complex process. Boomi's enabling that through single clicks now to be able to fine tune those yeah. models. That's heavy organic investment for Boomi as well. So you're going to see us across integration automation, API management, data management, we're, we're, we will acquire in all of those areas. So last question for you. I'll set it up by saying just some observations from the interviews here. Um, Fast feedback loops with Boomi, access to customer deployments, 300 million 
integrations. Your AI is now trained. Yeah. <laughs> Look, that's competitive advantage, so opportunity there. Um, very loyal customer base. They love I the love product, that. they love the product. Ecosystem's emerging. Agent Garden kind of shows you the way uh, with the marketplace. Um, you mentioned low code, lang chain, kind of integrating stuff for around data, runtime. This has a growth trajectory that is going beyond iPass. 100%. Um, so, as you look at that, what is your investment um, areas that you're going to put the most wood behind the arrow on? Is it ecosystem, product, all of the above? Uh, you don't need to put, give me percentages, but give, give me a, a feel for where your priorities will be. I mean, obviously, I can see value, because like, like companies like Amazon and other growth companies, they all start out this way. They got a flywheel going. Well, right now it's about fulfilling demand. So for us, part of this event right here is how do we engage with partners? Because the reality is with the market breaking our way and you look at companies that are moving away from technology like MuleSoft and they're moving into uh, Boomi in particular, we, we, we need partners. So you look at what, like what we're doing with Infosys and there's a big yeah. announcement around that today, it's fulfilling demand. So there's a big investment in just demand fulfillment. And the second thing is go to market expansion where we, we continue to hire. Uh, you know, I, I look at the news, I look at tech companies and the long list of layoffs, yeah. and Boomi's going to continue to hire, continue to expand, continue yeah. to grow. This is our moment. What's your pitch to the people out there that could be partners and or people who want to just join in and build on top of the platform? Um, what areas would you say would be good white spaces or, or areas to, to camp out on and build on top of or partner? What's the, what's the, what's well, the main? Well, you, you kind of called it out there a little bit ago is like you know, anything in line of business, if you're looking to, especially in the world of AI, as I'm just the firm believer in the transformative power of these agents that are coming, but if you're looking to build you know, enterprise grade agents, for HR, sales, marketing, finance, legal. We want you building those agents through and on the Boomi platform and they can be done near instantly. So the amount of time from idea to execution is, is, is near zero and that's, that's what we want. Steve, great to have you on theCUBE. Love the vision, love the team, look putting together. Great trajectory you guys are on. Market timing is, I mean, Timing it's, is everything. Boomi's done a lot of the hard, heavy lifting coming into this wave, so you look, guys are looking good. Um, final, final question. Next year, Boomi 2025, we'll be sitting here. What are we going to be talking about? What accomplishments will be on your, on your checklist? And then what is, will be the conversation next year? Well, I look at you know, a, a year ago when, you know, a year and a half ago, kind of when ChatGPT just came, became part of the, 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 the nomenclature, the, the terminology, everything we're talking about, right? Look at what's happened just here at Boomi. We, we had an idea, we're going to take all of this data and our, our AI that we've been working on for a long time. We're going to supercharge that with generative. We're going to build on large language models. We now have a technology a year later that can literally understand um, these are the systems I'd like to connect and, I, and doing it through English language. And I'd like to do that every Tuesday. Could you please <laughs> synchronize all my data for me? And it just knows, yeah. and that's a year. And we've yeah. trained it on 300 million integrations. A year from now, the productivity that we will see will be greater than anything. And then I'm talking about in the world of IT. We will see the yeah. most productive decade in IT that has ever been known to mankind. And Boomi's going to help usher that in. Yeah. Now that's thanks to the hard work of companies like OpenAI, Meta, yeah. Google, yeah. Microsoft, yeah. and the like. But I, I think the world that we live in, one short year from now, profoundly different. Awesome. Well, congratulations on the momentum and continued success. We'll be tracking you guys. I know will be on the road, talking to customers, and uh, congratulations. And great. What a great event. Thank you, thanks for being here. Steve Lucas, CEO of Boomi here on theCUBE, bringing all the action, talking the big game here on theCUBE. Check out the great market timing for Boomi. Congratulations on the great team. We'll be back with more coverage after this short break. All right, we're back. You're watching theCUBE. We're here with Jay Chaudhry, the CEO of Zscaler. Welcome back to theCUBE. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Dave, thank you. It's an honor. Uh, oh, the, the, really, the pleasure is ours. We saw you last night at your party. Uh, it's, it's awesome to see your community. Everybody wants to take pictures, <laughs> autographs, right? So <laughs> you're famous in this world. Uh, what are you hearing from customers at this show? Any themes you can share with us? And any differences, Jay, from a year ago at RSA? So, so first of all, uh, it's a great opportunity to meet so many customers out here. Mm. Uh, we did two announcements at the show. One, there's a phishing report based on about two billion phishing attacks that we blocked last year. Looking at the data, 
it has gone up 60% year over year. Because phishing is a starting point to steal credentials, and then they start doing ransomware attacks. So that's one theme, because we are making sure we can protect our customers against it, and our zero trust architecture helps us. Second announcement we made was, working with Google, we actually can provide third party access to applications from BYOD devices. Because third party risk is growing and that has to be done. Now in terms of conversation, there have been so many conversations with customers. Uh, obviously you'll expect AI being part of the conversation always these days. Uh, but fear of getting breached and the business stopping because of ransomware is number one concern on every CISO's mind. Yeah, and, and so last year there was talk, there was chatter about AI, Gen AI, yep. maybe obviously <coughs> uh, uh, attackers using AI to write better phishing emails. Yep. There seems to be much more conversation this year about the exposures that AI brings and thinking about how to secure <coughs> AI. That's right. How do you think about that? So, AI is a fascinating technology. Like many other technologies, it has two sides. It can help with business productivity, but it can be very dangerous. Think of a simple example. You can ask ChatGPT and say, tell me all the VPN systems this company has and what vulnerabilities do they have. It would have taken them days to collect this information. Now it's available in a matter of seconds. So identifying your attack surface, the starting point of attack becomes easy. As you said, phishing emails can be written very nicely. Then they cannot go from there. So we got to fight AI with AI. We are leveraging AI to actually analyze billions and billions of logs to actually figure out in this uh, a needle in the haystack to see if two users in this, in this company got compromised and the bad guys are trying to move to step two and three and four. So figuring out this technology is a big thing for us. But in addition to that, CISOs also want to make sure that they can securely use AI services. That has three pieces to it. One, they want to know what services are our employees going to use. CISOs aren't about stopping them. CISOs are supposed to enable business. AI is a business enabler. But it starts with where are they going. Number two, they want to control access. There are thousands of AI services. It's not just chat GPT. Which services do I want my companies to use? Here are five or 10 sanctioned ones. And number three, when they use it, they need to use it safely to make sure they don't really submit the source code of the company to say, do QA on it. And so Zscaler can do all three for our customers. Most of our large customers are using this security to what they call secure use of AI. I want to ask you about a sort of corner case, maybe it's uh -huh. not such a corner case. Hmm. I know of situations where, because you're talking about sort of a curated, approved set <coughs> of AI. Yep. I know of, of a couple of, of times I've heard this where developers were told you cannot use, uh, for instance, ChatGPT mm -hmm. in this case. Yep but they like ChatGPT, right. so they couldn't use it on their laptop, so what do they do? <coughs> they pull out the phone, sure. and they pull out the app. Yep. How should CISOs handle that, and can you help? Yeah, so every large company has to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Till solar winds happen, yeah. developers had a lot of freedom. <laughs> they could download open source tools. Then everyone realized that these tools could be dangerous. So more and more of these killer customers Yes, they block chat GPT or only have controlled access. Even if you download something on your phone, your source code is not going to go on your phone. So there are proper data protection solutions that Zscaler offers to make sure we protect data on the endpoint, we protect data in your email, in S3 bucket, or Snowflake, or wherever. That has to be done. Take my phone. It actually has a personal profile and work profile. When I'm doing my own Netflix or YouTube, it's on one side. My company doesn't see it, goes direct. When I'm going to access my applications, the data, it all sits in a container that's company owned. 
that's the right approach to do and that's what we enable yeah. with our customers. Authentic. Okay, I want to ask you about the, the survey that Barclays did, uh, Socket Kalia <laughs> uh, came out. It was a couple of months ago now. <laughs> Um, and, and I mean, I think of you as a category creator. You kind of created yep. the, the sassy category. Yep. And really kind of only the pure, the only pure play yep. really out there. I think yep. that's fair. Absolutely. Um, his survey, it was a small end, it was only about 100, but there was two things in there. One showed momentum mm -hmm. for Zscaler, our data shows the yep. same. Uh, but, but the other takeaway was a market decline for the <coughs> first time ever in hardware-based, appliance-based firewalls. Yep. And so I thought that was an interesting data point. It's something that you've been pre preaching, <coughs> predicting yep. for yep. a long, long time. It's, it's finally, yep. feels like the market's finally catching up to your vision. Mm -hmm. what, what are you seeing out there? How would you respond? You know, inertia is powerful. Yeah. Some yeah. people <laughs> keep on doing what they're doing. Yeah. That's part of our cyber issues too, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Because we are using old technologies when hackers have no inertia, hackers move on and embrace new approaches faster. But I think part of the reason this has happened, this has been happening, uh, this means the firewall sales have stayed pretty good till recently is the following. As cyber attacks are happening. So what, the company gets breached, what do people do? The budget opens up. They had 100 firewalls, they say go and buy another 100 firewalls. Okay, the budget opens up, so a lot of companies have been buying more of the old stuff because that's what they knew. As we have evangelized the stuff, now we have over 40% of Fortune 500 companies that are customers. In fact, I have so many CIOs and CISOs who are repeat customers, not only once, not only twice, sometimes three or four times. So, it is, the awareness is going up. But also, you know, the, the data centers are going down the number of applications running, the traffic had to go down. I expect this to go down a couple of years ago. Then I learned about six months ago why it has taken longer to go down. I was talking to a CIO, he said I'm so proud that 60% of my applications have moved to the cloud and only 40% are left in the data center. I said that's good, that means only 40% of the traffic goes to the data center. He said perhaps. I said, if that's the case, probably in the past year, you should not have upgraded a single firewall, load balancers, router, or switch. He smiled, he said, I wish that were true. <laughs> now, why wasn't it true? Even though he had rolled out SD-WAN, he was still bringing all branch traffic to the data center, then here pinning over an express route to Azure. Old approach, because that's what always done it. As traffic was flowing through the data center, he's still upgrading firewalls and routers and switches. In the Zscaler world, you go direct. You don't have to go through a few choke points. As more and more customers start doing so, uh, hardware-based or data center-based firewalls are bound to go down. Yeah, so they were throwing band-aids at the problem. Exactly. Because they always, this is the way they always this, did it. Yes. And now, starting to realize, hey, you know, to your point, uh, uh, security budgets are going up significantly faster yes. than the overall. I would say our data shows the overall is growing about 3.4% at mm -hmm. the macro, IT spending. Mm -hmm. Security is probably triple that. Yes. Okay, sounds about yep. right, maybe even a little bit more. Yes. Okay. But it's not like you have unlimited budget if you're a CISO. We're also seeing uh, IT organizations are stealing budget from other places mm -hmm. to fund Gen AI. That's true. And probably not from the security budget, clearly not from the security budget, but maybe yes. business budgets or other AI mm -hmm. budgets. That's but right. But still, th there's not unlimited budget, so you have to at some point say, can we do this smarter? Mm -hmm. It sounds like that cycle is starting to hit now. Yes. And also, customers are tired of too many security point products. They want consolidation and simplification. But they don't want consolidation of all this to one security platform vendor. Imagine it's one vendor with all security products you depend on gets compromised. It's a bad thing. Imagine your vendor provides applications and security at the same time and gets compromised. Right. That's a bad day for you. So we think consolidation to a small number of platforms is good, but you don't want to one vendor. So we are big fans of a separate provider for EDRs, separate for identity, and we play an important role 
uh, to be inline policy enforcement engine. It's working, that's why when we go to CrowdStrike Falcon, we see you there, mm -hmm. we see Okta there, mm -hmm. so you guys are good partners. Yes. Having said that, I'll show you some other data from our survey. Okay. The, vendor, the, the customers are not able to consolidate the number of vendors. This is what do you expect over the next 12 months in terms of the, the number of vendors that you have installed. 51% of the customers said increase, and, and I think 37% said stay the same, so only 9% only were able to, to actually decrease the number of vendors. This is an age old problem. And, and we asked them why, and they right. said, well, I need best of breed. Now you're best of breed. Mm -hmm. You know, those, 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 the partners that we talked about are best of breed. But customers yeah. are still struggling to minimize the number of tools they have installed. How do we get out of this vicious, vicious cycle, this inertia, if you will? Yeah, so I must say, I'm a little bit surprised I was looking at this, at this data. data. This because our customers that are large enterprises mm are actually doing significant consolidation. Uh, uh, and every Zscaler sale reduces about from four or five vendors down to us. We replace four or five vendors by our Zscaler solution. Now, I tell you, there is certainly an issue in this area. What's the issue? This is my dialogue with the CIO of a manufacturing company in the Midwest. He said budgets are tight. <clears throat> Buying new stuff is hard. But eliminating what I already have in place is much harder. He said people have emotional ties, <laughs> sense of ownership, pride. There may be five reasons to get rid of it, but they come with one corner case to keep it. Unless CIOs and CISOs take leadership and say, we need to get rid of this legacy stuff. They sit out there, they linger out there. And, and that's what has to be done. The mindset change has to be driven by CIOs and CISOs, and some are doing more than others. Well see, I think you're in the minority when I saw this yes. data. I said, I have to ask Jay and George, mm -hmm. and, I, and I get the same answer from CrowdStrike, is actually we're not seeing this. In our customer base, we're seeing the consolidation. Mm -hmm. Of course, you, you heard Palo Alto last quarter <coughs> said, uh, you know, fatigue, and you guys <laughs> picked up on that, and, and so, but you're not seeing that, that fatigue is what you said last quarter. That's I right. Know, yeah, I know you, you're in a quiet period, we're not talking about financials, but, yep. but that, to me, mm -hmm. says that you're in the minority, which is the other flip side <coughs> of this, Jay, is this <coughs> is actually good news, <laughs> because that means there's a huge market yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And for you guys. Absolutely, so. and our platform is expanding as well. Customers don't want lots of consoles out there. Right. But it is true, customers don't want mediocre point products. One of the challenges our customers are facing out there is that the legacy vendors are claiming to do all kinds of stuff. Five, six years ago, when we were out there, the traditional firewall and security vendors will say, securing the cloud, how is that possible? It's going to stay on-prem. Then they saw our adoption, then they say, oh, we can do that too. I think one of the big issues our industry is facing is customers are getting confused, largely because legacy vendors are claiming to do zero trust while they are simply bolting things on firewalls and all. Spinning a VM firewall or VM VPN in the cloud doesn't make it zero trust architecture. I just finished a long conversation with a customer. He said, help me describe the difference. It took me about 20 minutes, then the light bulb went on. And he said, huh, I thought you could do zero trust on firewalls. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're creating a false sense of security. Yeah, and so it's very hard for a company that, that has this massive portfolio, mm -hmm. trying to be all things to all people, to also be best of breed. Exactly. I get the, I mean, every CEO's job is to <clears throat> expand the TAM. Right. All right. You happen to create a market, mm -hmm. you got a big tailwind, mm -hmm. you have a lot of, yep. uh, of, of room ahead of you. Yep. You know, at some point, you know, when you get big enough, you maybe have to you know, make those decisions. Mm -hmm. We've seen it in tech yep. many, many times. Yep. But I don't see how you can be everything to everybody you and can't. best of breed at the same time. <clears throat> Absolutely you can't. Uh, so we have been very disciplined in terms of what we want to do and what we don't want to do. I can tell you in the past years, so many years, uh, our investors sometimes have, or even analysts have said, oh, why don't you guys buy an EDR company or identity company or SD-WAN company? Say we have a North Star. 
I want to be the policy engine in line to do it the best way possible than anybody else. There's expansion in that area, for example. We did it for employees and workforce, secure access to applications. Then we expanded it to workloads. Workloads are some like users. They talk to internet, they talk to each other. Then we expanded, expanded the same core solution to IoT OT access. And then your B2B customer suppliers and partners. So there's immense opportunity for us to grow without getting into a mature commoditized market. Yeah, you feel like there's no shortage of, of market. Not at you. all, you not at all. That, yeah. Our customers are buying, our presence is expanding. Jerry, I know you got a big dinner to go to. That's Thanks all. so much, we really appreciate your time. And uh, welcome back anytime, love to have you. Dave, thank you. All right, our pleasure. Okay, and thank you for watching. Keep it right there. We'll be right back to wrap day two from RSA 2024. You're watching theCUBE. Good morning everyone and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit here in the Mile High City, Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host Rob Strecce. We are here in the Colorado Convention Center. The floor is buzzing with energy. Yeah, Mile High Energy, to put it, uh, I, I think what you said earlier, calling it Red Hot. <laughs> red Hot, Red, red Hat, Hat Summit. Red Hat Summit, <laughs> is, and Ansible Fest as yeah. well, is like really key because there's so many fun announcements that really take you from pre-thought you know, thought on AI all the way to deployment and production that I think really is key to where organizations are at right now. Yeah, and yeah. I, and we, <laughs> we have somebody pretty important to, to talk we through do that indeed. as well. We do, indeed. What a great segue to welcome Matt Hicks. He is the CEO of Red Hat. Thank you so much for coming back on theCUBE. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, excited to be here. So as we were just talking about, there have been a, a large number of product announcements and enhancements, but I know that there are two in particular that you believe really bring the Red Hat playbook and ethos yeah. of open communities, um, open contributions, and open ideas to AI. I'd love you to just walk our viewers a little bit through those. Yeah, if you look, um, the two ingredients I think at the center for us are the opening of language and code models. Because if we look at what's happening in AI, there's a language element of can you summarize better, can you understand documents, go through them. And then there's a coding element that's near and dear to my heart of that I think it will change how we write apps, how we get, build better quality. But then hand in hand with that goes the Instruct Lab technology, which is as good as these models get, they never do my thing or the thing I want. And training them has been, at least for me, impressively hard over the last year. The technology can work and this just uh, puts it within reach of being able to train using a lot of new technologies uh, well. And so teaching these two really capable models new things, I think, is at the core of everything else you'll see at Summit this year. Yeah, I, I think again, the, to me, it was so exciting to see that demo that was done. I, I thought, you, I, by the way, I thought the, the how you progressed through the keynote was fantastic. Awesome. And I, I think again, it was really helping bring the pieces together and really in a, in a way kind of pull that thread through. Yeah. Uh, and I think part of that really was the fact that it, it is about partnerships. Yeah. A yeah. lot of the announcements today are with partners and even some of the ones that happened at Ansible Fest yep. keynote as well are around partnerships. Talk to us about that, because yeah. I, you even said it uh, you know, on stage, it kind of felt like the early days of Linux again. Yeah, yeah. No, it, um, I think Red Hat's at its best when we are focused on building blocks. That's what, yeah, I started Red Hat 18 plus years ago, and our building block was Linux. It was make this consumable for enterprises, light up hardware, work with the OEMs, and put it in the hands of developers and people. When I look at, at this work with RHEL AI, on one side, everything's different. It's not CPU based, it's GPU based. Um, the machines are a bit different, but it is the exact same playbook of how do you take all this excitement and innovation, make it consumable to enterprises, and then work with both the technology providers like NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, and the OEMs who are going to put together like a Dell PowerEdge that users can then start to work with. And I love 
every second of it because it just feels um, back to our sweet spot, the thing we we do, and it really has reached to anyone on the planet that's starting with AI because of those partnerships. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of that also talks to the simplicity that yeah, people are yeah. looking for because there's always the top of the pyramid accounts that are going to have the people, the, yeah. the staffing that they can throw at it, but I, I, I would suspect that in the back of your mind, it's like, how do we get to that big middle, that fat middle of people who might not have that skill set and have those? Is that a really also part of the strategy of how you glue those two layers together? A hundred percent. I would say it's on two areas of both end users with it, where I love the, I talked about, you know, this doesn't solve all problems, but there are a lot of problems you can put in this knowledge bucket and skills bucket. So I think it'll be really applicable for end users um, and it makes it simpler. But then if you look at like our ISV ecosystem or the system integrators, it also like they're going to have more reach to customers than we will and they can build their next thing embedding AI into it in also a more simple fashion. So I, I love both elements of that. Of there will be a lot of solutions built that use this inside that customers don't ever need to see. It just makes more powerful solutions. And then I enjoy every minute of working with customers when you see that light bulb. They're like, this is what I would do with knowledge and this would be my skill. Because um, it's reinforcing of this is a pattern people have struggled with, it has that value. So I think we'll see both there. Well, when I hear you talking about how the models are so impressively hard and exceedingly yeah. difficult to train, I mean, I, I would have no hope. Yeah. And so the idea that you are democratizing yeah. the, the training of these models, can you talk about the ways in which you envisage companies actually putting them and, and making them come to life and what, yeah. they, what they'll do? I think there's, there's two elements of that. One, in my experience, I've used a lot of these models and as, as impressive as they are, they all have gaps. Figuring out how to plug a gap is almost impossible on it. So one side on this is we want to make it really simple to if you use Granite or the code models and say, this has a gap of knowledge that I know, we can make it as easy as contributing to Wikipedia to say, I will, I will give you my knowledge and skill, you make the model better for everyone. So there's a widening of open source contributors. Um, then the other side I would say is, if you go back a year, you needed to spend a lot of money to even try this operation. At this point, one of the things I'm most passionate about is we can make the training work in like single phases on a laptop. So if it is your IP, and you're not ready to spend a half a million dollars on a machine, uh, you can at least start to do what I did in the early days at Linux, like just my laptop or my desktop, see if directionally um, my skill, my knowledge sticks with this. And then if it does, you can progress those bets. That progression, I think, also democratizes what people can do with the hardware they have, um, even if they're not going to contribute it. If it's like, this is my business idea, I want to progress it. Not many people can jump into the uh, really expensive hardware that quickly. So those are the two I love, is others contributing in, and then you being able to work from those and still hold your own IP, if you want. Yeah, I, in speaking about expensive uh, hardware, I mean, you, you <laughs> had, you had you know, Dell from the systems, the OEM perspective on yep. stage, you had Pat Gelsinger on, uh, yeah, which I yeah. thought you pulled off, which, I know how hard those are, and being able to talk to somebody who's not actually in the room and have that conversation was fantastic. And then uh, Stephanie had NVIDIA on yeah, later yeah. on. Uh, I, I, we're going to have all of them on later in the day and tomorrow, yep, yeah. so I am excited about that. But help, help us you know, understand it. what is it like to work with them around these ideas? Because I mean, even Dell got into, hey, we used Instruct Lab and things of that nature, and yeah. you know, Pat was talking about some of that as well. And yeah. It, you know, if you look at, it's like a renaissance right now of hardware innovation. So you have NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, and as Josh mentioned, you'll have others building ridiculous capabilities in GPUs. But then you need OEMs to like, you know, in the case of Dell, I'm going to put eight of them together in a PowerEdge box for you. 
those boxes are really powerful. And so all of a sudden now, like a single power edge, you can actually train your own models and run a lot of inference. And so you have both the interest in the GPU creator saying, I need use cases that will use these and use them to their greatest extent. And then you have the Lenovo's and Dell's and Cisco's of the world that will pull this together in an appliance that can put AI in a box. And getting AI in a box, like this is not going to be a, a reality a year from now, it'll be a reality like a month from now, which those are exciting because it, it just makes something work that was a concept a year ago uh, for a lot of the world. Well, and, and I, th I think again, when you start to look at image mode and things of that nature yeah. with RHEL, and it, it seemed like, it, it reminded, to your point about going backwards, it reminded me of the craze of virtual appliances. Yeah, yep. And how do we simplify the deployment of AI? Yep. Is that what you guys are seeing that, yeah. I mean, to me that makes total sense. A hundred, if you look at the, the layers that go below running a model, it's astounding how much complexity is in there. And so the simplicity that I grew up with within Unix and Linux of building blocks and I can weave them together, it's still there. It's just a thousand times bigger. And so having that appliance, like I can, this machine only exists to run and train LLMs. Uh, let me just get the appliance working. I actually think it's a round of appliance technology that it won't be craziness this time around. It'll be in that space of more utility than craziness there. So, uh. Well, speaking of your ecosystem of partners, and you, you, you were mentioning the big tech players, but on the main stage you were also talking about academia yeah, and, yeah. And, the, and the AI alliance yep. and, and bringing in uh, research institutions that are, that are taking breakthroughs and turning them into models within a week. Yeah. How closely are you working with researchers and, and what do you see as the promise of working together with academics and, and researchers at colleges and universities? It has been a, a total sea change from the world that I grew up in, which was, you know software engineering, you can build anything on it. On the third floor in our building, we have a group from MIT that works with us every single day. The knowledge and depth you need to make training work better, it is almost like the PhD academia work. You'll do your doctorate on that, but there's such, such a strong link to academia will contribute what they've done in papers and contribution. It's the first time I've ever seen it actually, where they are the driving force behind AI. The mathematics, it is so deep. Uh, they're the creators. We are the channel for that, to put it in the hands, of, make it work on laptops, link it up to GPUs. But it's such a symbiotic relationship there. It's, um, you know, we say like how much you work. It, it really is, it is every day. They're a core part of the team. Um, and then we'll expand that to universities around the world. But it's a new community for us. It's not just kernel contributors now, it is. And an untapped uh, one, it sounds like, too. It really is. It's, uh, so I love those of just seeing open source expand and then being able to put it in the hands of people that can use it and build new ideas, is, uh, it's really exciting. So I, I think that is a great segue back into kind of the first announcement around Granite and, and really the open sourcing of Granite for both the LLM side and the code assistance side. Yeah. Help people understand why that is such a big deal. Yeah, if, um, if you look at what it takes to build what we'll call a base model for this, so um, specifically we'll call it the pre-training phase, which is like download the internet and learn from it and, and produce this thing. Uh, it costs in the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to produce that file, basically. Um, so it's a very tough thing to say, there's not going to be a lot of companies doing this. It's going to be a few companies doing that. So we wanted to figure out like where can we build an open source community around that when it's a little disingenuous to say like you should try this as well. I'm like if it's 100 million, I won't be trying it anytime <laughs> soon. Uh, but this is why we picked Apache as the license yeah. because it creates freedom and usage to say we have put the 100 million dollars plus into this. You can use it how you see fit. You can build derivative works. It can be open source. It can be proprietary. The second side of this that we're really passionate about is openness in the data because we talk about things like copyright infringement. Uh, 
those models are trained on the internet and the world. And like creators put their own content out there and took the time to, it is copyrighted and code, they have licenses on it. Like we live in open source. We're very passionate about saying as a user of the model, you should be able to adhere to what those creators wanted. Those are the two areas. I doubt we have it perfect coming out of the gate, but why this has been really fundamental to us is try to um, really chart that course and how we can make the data open and protect creators and protect users and then make it permissive enough in usage license-wise to let you chase whatever idea you want with it. What, what I also, I, I think it was an understated comment was the indemnification as yeah, well. Because yeah. you start to look at organizations and they're afraid if, hey, is this on you know, proprietary data, been trained on proprietary data where somebody like the New York Times is going to come after me yeah. once I go and launch it or something like yeah. that. Yeah, or you think of um, code in the case. Oh yeah. I love people that say, uh, don't worry, it was trained on permissive licenses. Permissive licenses still require you to attribute yes. the, the original author. Um, and licenses like GPL, like they don't have to be scary if you're comfortable with the license redistribution rights. We live with 40, 50 different open source licenses tied to copyright in our world. So it is a sweet spot for us to say like, this isn't an area to be afraid of. You just have to understand the origins to make sure you're treating the outputs properly. So it'll evolve a lot over the next year, but that is, you know, if I look at the last 30 years of Red Hat's existence in open source, I feel like this is a phenomenal link for us to be able to add in making this stuff safe to use as well. Yeah, I mean, it, this, this really is a recurring theme that this is, this moment in time is Red Hat's sweet spot in yeah, terms yeah. of the way, the, the Red Hat way, yeah. uh, the way you approach open source and, and, and in technology in general. Uh, during your keynote, I felt like you were being, you were in a bit of a reflective and contemplative mood. You talked a little bit about joining Red Hat 18 years ago yeah, as a Linux yeah. admin and, and working your way up to, to managing and leading teams and now here you are, been CEO for about two years. Talk a little bit about, about your journey and, and about what this moment in time, this, this, this AI era that we are now living in, and, and the excitement that you're seeing, and, 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 and how it has reminded you maybe of, of when you got your start. It, it is, there's a, behind us 500 feet is the Instruct Lab group, and it's a young group of engineers that I see myself in every day, because for me with Linux, the moment that, and I was a consultant, I was doing Unix deployments and sysadmin all day, I would work twice as hard to make Linux systems work because I could understand every piece of them. I could change them. I learned a lot, this is in like the early 2000s, I learned a lot of programming itself from seeing how the kernel was built. And so that like, Feeling like um, I can use this to show my own potential was really powerful. I'd say like it's the undercurrent for my whole career. And I get to watch these early career associates see the same thing in AI. And so this is why I'm, cool. I'm not a fan of like AI is just something you use, it's behind an API call. I like the word like demystify it. This is something you can put your fingerprints on, you can show the world what you can do. So that's that link of like when I see Instruct Lab and training and open source models, it's today's generation's equivalent of what I grew up with in Linux. And it's, um, I love it, I love every minute of it. So. How, do you, how do you see an AI changing Red Hat's ability to go faster? Yeah. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm curious, because you guys always use your own software, you know, as somebody would say, drink your own champagne before, yeah. you know, everybody else. How have you seen it change kind of inside Red Hat? I'll give you one example. So we, we really took the decision to, as we were seeing this technology go from like its inception to working, to working really well, to like, I can't believe this works on a laptop. It was about a month ago that we said, we will reframe everything that we're doing at Summit around this. And it was the fastest I have seen Red Hat move in 18 years. Instruct Lab didn't exist as a thing. There was no logo, there was no booth. There was, um, 
there was a quickly progressing technology that we felt like had the impact to change the world. Uh, my teams know, it's like we go back after this and the pace doesn't slow down on it because it is just such an amplifier to the core skills and what we do. It's, um, I see it as very additive to teach us speed and then have us bring in the assurance and safety that we're known for on it. So it's, it's been fun. It changes every element of how we do support, um, how we do internal training, what we put on engineers' laptops, how we do sales. Uh, it'll touch every aspect of the company. So we know that the pace of change is staggering and it's only accelerating and talking a little bit about that momentum and how it has allowed you and empowered you to move so much faster. Yeah. Where will we be one year from now at the next Red Hat <laughs> Summit? What are we going to be talking about? What are, what are the, the underlying Ooh. themes? Hopefully adoption. I think that's where you always start. <laughs> okay. Like a new idea you want to be talking about. Like the um, Dr. Grant and Rudolph, when they were talking about uh, the work at Boston Children's Hospital, I think nothing drives us more than seeing clinicians using your technology in radiology. Like it's, um, so I think next year I would hope to see lots and lots of the adoption. But I would say right now as an industry, I feel like the whole world is in, when we talk about dev to prod, they're all in dev right now because it is changing so fast, you don't have a stable foundation. My hope is to move a chunk of that to production with it because we can give them that, it's not going to be 10 years like REL, but if it's a year of stability, it gives you just enough to get your value out of your investment while you do the next thing. So that that's my hope for next year is like shift the industry a little more to production and just hear some of these incredible stories, what people do with your technology is. That's, uh, that's where we live. Production and adoption. Matt Hicks, thank you so much for coming on the show again. We always enjoy having you. Thank you very much. I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Stretch. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit. You are watching theCUBE, the leader in technology enterprise coverage.